plenária número 1 um do ABM Week 2018. Meu nome é Francisco Dornelas. Eu moro no Espírito Santo e sou é, o diretor da Regional do Espírito, da, do Espírito Santo, da ABM. E é uma satisfação grande a gente estar aqui mais uma vez esse ano, conduzindo uma plenária de um assunto que interessa a todos nós, que é tentar entender, ouvindo de quem sabe das coisas, né? quem está lidando com esses desafios, quais são os desafios, qual é o, para onde vai a mineração e a siderurgia, né? A visão de algumas algumas empresas aí. É, o nosso nosso a plenária, ela vai tratar da dos caminhos futuros da mineralogia, da, da indústria de mineração e siderurgia, the future paths of mining and steel industry. É, nós estamos coordenando aqui juntamente com a minha colega Vânia, atualmente lá no Ministério das Minas e Energia, como diretor do, do setor de mineração. É, alguns desafios que o setor de mineração e metalurgia estão passando, não são poucos e não são somente esses, mas esses são alguns deles. É, escassez né, de produto de de qualidade na mineração, a substituição intensiva do, do aço pelos sucedâneos, o setor siderúrgico, é uma demanda ambiental cada vez mais forte, a sociedade clamando por, para, pela questão ambiental, é competição fair and not fair de mercado, atratividade de pessoal, de talento para trabalhar nas organizações, é, a inserção do setor na indústria 4.0, que está presente, é, é item de pauta de todos. Né? E, por último, e não menos importante, essa nova onda de proteção de mercado, como recentemente o governo americano taxando a importação de aço. Alguns desses desafios, isso aqui é um dado do Mining Engineering de fevereiro de 2017, em 15 anos, 20% de degradação entre minério cru e minério aplicado. E no, no termo siderúrgico, dados de 2017, aproximadamente 70% da capacidade mundial com overcapacity, sobre capacidade de produção de 660 milhões, e cerca de um terço, ou seja, cerca de um terço da capacidade instalada mundial está é, ociosa. É, esse timetable aqui é muito interessante, porque mostra a, a importância relativa dos materiais, metais, polímeros, compósitos e cerâmicos, com visão até 2020, essa parte branca representando os metals, incluindo o aço. Eu coloquei aqui uns remarks aqui importantes, que foi a descoberta do convertedor, o Bessemer, as duas grandes guerras mundiais e a invenção do motor a combustão, que fez com que explosivamente o consumo de aço crescesse violentamente no mundo. Porém, a partir de 60, os compósitos e outros produtos ocupando violentamente o espaço, recuperando o terreno perdido, vamos dizer assim. Ou seja, o que nós esperamos, trazendo essa sessão aqui para a BMW Week? Né? É como algumas empresas, né? how big companies do setor, da Austrália, da Ásia, Latina América, estão lidando com, essas, com esses desafios. Quais são suas estratégias para vencê-los e manterem-se perenes? E também, vocês vão ter a presença aqui do, do, do representante do governo brasileiro, qual é a posição do governo e as perspectivas para o setor de mineração na visão do representante do governo brasileiro. É, alguns alguns é, é, insights aqui das empresas que estarão aqui representando as empresas. Né? A BHP, por exemplo, é uma empresa de 133 anos, e um dos itens do Risk Management da BHP fala da, de, de failure nas reservas ou 
da, da, da incapacidade de se manter as reservas, algo que possa afetar os resultados futuros da, do negócio. Isso tirado do, do BHP Report 2018. O grupo Post, com 50 anos de existência, vai estar aqui falando para a gente, os últimos resultados dele, 2017, e uma coisa que chama a atenção seria o crescimento Out of Steel, Grupo Posco se preparando para ser um fornecedor da cadeia de, 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 automó de automóveis elétricos, que é o, um grande é, abertura que está acontecendo no mercado mundial. Por sinal, na, na quinta-feira nós vamos ter uma revisa redonda falando sobre aplicações de não ferrosos para este setor, em baterias e veículos elétricos. É, o, o Grupo Gerdau, com 116 anos, a posição geopolítica, geográfica e verticalização parece ser um dos elementos chaves da estratégia em curso da Gerdau. O que mais? Nós vamos ouvir o Faraco já já falando para nós aqui. E o governo brasileiro, recentemente, tomou importantes medidas de, de reduzir as incertezas legais no que diz respeito à legislação vigente sobre a mineração. Nós vamos ouvir também o Vicente falando um pouquinho disso aqui. Ou seja, quais são os próximos desafios para promover o negócio de mineração no Brasil? Né? Então, para falar sobre esses desafios, nós convidamos, né, nós vamos ter aqui a presença, a fala do, do Brian Quinn, da BHP. Depois nós vamos ter a Posco, o Don Hawking, que é da, das operações da CSP, ele vai falar da, do grupo Posco. Brian vai falar de Reshaping the Future. Mr. King vai falar de Answers to the Future, do Posco. Na sequência, o, o, o Faraco, da Gerdau, vai falar sobre a Vision of the Future, uma visão do futuro. E, last but not least, o, o Vicente Lobo vai falar das perspectivas da mineração no Brasil. Depois nós teremos uma sessão de, de, de debates, moderada pelo Alexandre Lira, que é o VP da Valorec Grupo South America. Eu vou, é, nesse momento, convidar o Mr. Quinn para fazer a primeira apresentação. Por favor, é, Brian. O Brian, ele, 24 anos de empresa na, na, na BHP, graduado em engenharia, é, foi presidente aí da, dos ativos de manganês na Austrália e na África do Sul até 2014, e ele também o Global Head of Technology e Geociência da, da empresa, de engenharia de projetos e melhorias até 2016. Fala, fala um espanhol porreta e um pouco de português, porque morou um ano no Brasil, né, o Brian? Dois anos no Chile, mora, morou dois anos no Chile. E é o responsável por assets do, do grupo BHP. Por favor, para. Thank you, Francisco, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will speak in English. My Portuguese is very poor. My Spanish is less poor. And my English is so-so. <laughs> uh, it's an on honor for me to present uh, to, the, to this group uh, at this fine event today. It's uh, good to be here in Sao Paulo. Uh, I've actually spent much time in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. Um, in my current role and many other parts of South America, which I work. And just as my home country in Australia um, is, mining is very important to the economy here in Brazil. It plays an enormous role in the socioeconomic development of both countries, uh, when I refer to Australia and Brazil. But this actually comes with you know, significant responsibility as well as an industry. The skills and the expertise of the people in this room and many other rooms like this drive the contribution of mining to the economy and development of Brazil. And it's actually our collective responsibility in how we uh, both use innovation, technology, and our skills and the, and the, and the future people coming through the industry to unlock the, the future potential and ensure the country as a whole for Brazil benefits from the presence of mining. 
So with this in mind, I want to use this time to talk about the opportunities and possibilities, about the future of the mining industry uh, on a global scale. It's not enough uh, just for the mining industry to extract resources and sell and refine them anymore. In my view, there's, there's far more this industry needs to do. And as key contributors to the economy, we must be engines for progress and development. Our presence must strengthen the societies and economies that we work within and also ensure the environments and the communities in which we operate and can actually have some benefit. However, to talk about the future, I must talk about the past and acknowledge the past. And so I will start by taking, talking about the tragedy of the Fondal Dam failure at Samarco Germano complex in Minas Gerais. On the 5th of November, 2015, my company BHP is a 50% shareholder in Samarco, as, as people would be aware, along with our partner, Avali. We do acknowledge the terrible impact of the disaster uh, and, you know, we're very sincerely sorry for what actually happened with uh, the Samarco event incident. And we know we can never uh, bring back the lives of those that were lost, the fathers, the brothers, uh, the children. We can never replace the homes, the memories, the item and items of sentimental value. And we can't, you know, just stitch together the, the fabric of the villages and the, uh, the items uh, of value that were woven for hundreds of years. But what we can do and what we will do uh, is do what, do what it takes to repair, to remediate and compensate and do the right thing uh, by, by the, both the environment and the people who were impacted. And this goes in very much line with our commitment we made as a company several weeks after the incident uh, when you know, words couldn't describe what everyone would have seen on, on the TV and in real life. People talk about the environmental disaster of the Fondale Dam break, but it was also, over, and they talk about the environmental disaster, but it was also an, an overwhelming social disaster. And we know we face a massive task uh, to, put, you know, to put the efforts back in for the next 10 to 15 years and provide whatever support we need to, to in the long term to ensure Renova Foundation completes the work to put it back to how it was. Renova has done a great job and we have seen a lot of progress, especially on the environmental front. The water quality downstream of the dam failure has met regulatory requirements and standards one year ahead of plan. And when you travel down the Rio Dolce, it's amazing to see how much the remediation has, uh, has improved over at least one year. Much of the remediation is well advanced and all efforts are being made to help the people return to their livelihoods as, as quickly as possible to restore these communities. And now that Renova has the environmental licenses for the uh, chosen site at Lavara, uh, construction of Bento Rodriguez uh, resettlement has actually started and, and progressing well. But, we'll, we, but we will not rest until Bento Rodriguez, Paracatu, Gesteria and the many homes of people and the fabrics of those communities has actually been mended properly and will not rest until the people's livelihoods of fishing on the Rio Dolce and the coast of Espiritu Santo, Santo uh, back in their boats and their families are enjoying and, and, uh, the, the customs they had and customers are buying the fish that was once caught from the rivers, as they have for many generations. The right thing to do is obviously learn from what happened at Samarco and along with Vale and, and, and ourselves and Samarco, we appointed an investigation to be done to understand the immediate causes uh, of the dam failure and those, share, those learnings have been shared broadly across the global mining industry. We've also conducted a full assessment across all of the, joint, all of the global portfolio for BHP and I know many other companies have done the same to ensure that uh, the safety of those dams in other parts of the world are also in, in, in the right uh, shape. As was my introduction from Francisco, uh, I look after uh, Samarco in Brazil, uh, a big coal operation in Colombia, a uh, big copper operation in uh, Peru, uh, iron ore project in Guinea in Africa, and also the uh, Resolution Underground Copper project 
uh, one of the deepest copper projects in, in the US, in Arizona. And like uh, Samarco, um, these assets all, we, we, ha we own a significant share in all those assets and we do not operate these assets, but we take responsibility as a shareholder to ensure that these joint ventures are very, very serious about ensuring the places that workplaces are safe, they're, they're, they're actually working to improve the performance both on the environment and in the community front and aligning to the ICMM standards uh, that, um, in, in particular, the principles for sustainable development. And so when I was recently at Serrahon, uh, which is an open cut coal mine, one of the biggest in the world, um, it, uh, it's a joint venture between BHP Anglo and Glencore. You know, rehabilitation is, is routinely uh, done for the, the open pit. Uh, there's a program, it's achieved national and international benchmark for its multifaceted approach uh, through local employment, you know, progressive, um, progressive mitigation of the impacts uh, in terms of land degradation, de desertification, and climate change in tropical drain, dry forests. So it's actually done a lot to sort of uh, put the, the environment back to how it was uh, pre-mining. And the plans involve rebuilding as soon as the area is no longer in use. And they don't wait for the mine to close, they do the work as they progress. And they're using technology. They're using technology to tr transform mine land into stable and productive ecosystems. And natural vegetation and fauna are recovering very quickly. Serahon implements monitoring programs and invests in scientific studies to continually evaluate these programs and identify opportunities for improvement. They monitor all sorts of baselines and use the, the relevant technology to do that in the field. They ensure the rehabilitation is progressive towards the original state, which is obviously very important from a mining industry point of view. The, uh, as an example, Cedro Hon actually monitors the Jaguar. Uh, whose position in that region is the top of the food chain. So obviously, if it's surviving and it's growing and it's actually moving forward in, uh, in, with population, it gives an idea that the ecosystem is rebalancing. And revegetation contributes to significant reductions in soil erosions, dust control, and also the impacts for the surrounding communities as well. So the use of monitoring, the use of technology, and the use of sort of taking clear action in line with international standards actually allows Sarah Hon as a company to progress and deliver sort of uh, both international and, and national benchmarks. But the future presents us so many opportunities like this to build truly sustainable and, and enduring uh, success for all of our stakeholders by the use of technology and the use of innovation and good engineering. While we work hard to be more productive, to create value for the, our shareholders, we also must work very, very closely in partnership with our communities and our host governments. We all need to create and run mines that are recognised for their high performance in a very broad sense. We need to think, plan and set for today to deliver tomorrow. We need to protect and preserve our environment and ensure communities are better off because we are there. And we need to make sure the workplace is, is very safe, productive, and a very diverse workplace uh, also, and workforce also. And to achieve this, to achieve all of those things, uh, the next phase in the future really looks to technology to make the next step change. And as an industry, we have the opportunity and the right to lead that also. Because we should be seen as the engine to progress and to do the development in the right way using innovation and technology collectively and in a powerful way. And that means we need to actually uh, understand the impact of our interactions. We need to make sure the activities uh, that we're working with societies, the economies, the environments, and the communities are all behind where we're going as an industry. And we must continue rewarding shareholders, um, continue rewarding our shareholders and lifting our operation performance against benchmark levels, so the financials support the direction we want to go in terms of making step change in our industry. The good news is that in recent decades, the industry as a whole has begun to think more holistically, in my view, to be a partner of the communities and our host operations, which host our operations. But 
there's still much more to be done. We must partner in development to help build legacies in local communities and economies and our society economy at large that outlasts our operations. The boom-bust nature of mining has impacted our host communities and as much as it impacts our employees and contractors. While mining is always cyclic uh, by nature and mines do close, we do not accept leaving behind towns that are incapacitated by closed uh, operations. Even after closed mines, even after mines have been closed, there's many opportunities to repurpose those mines using technology. An example is a closed mine, it's called San Manuel in Arizona. It has been, I guess, ongoing rehabilitation for many years, but recently we're repurposing it to be a massive solar uh, energy farm to provide local communities lower cost power using the infrastructure facilities of the old mine, as an example, partnering with technology companies. Likewise, during our operations, we need to take care to work with our host communities to collaborate on social economic opportunities and the environment and be very aware of the impacts we have on the earth as a whole. The history of the mining industry and the resources that were easiest to find and reach have all been extracted, as far as I know. So increasingly, exploration and mine development needs to occur in remote areas using much better technology and in using, working with the communities and the environment that will be vulnerable if we don't work properly with them. So the world needs mining, we all know that. And uh, without it, there's no buildings, no roads, uh, no communications, no pipes for running waters, uh, and there's no fertilizers for food, so food will diminish. But it's our responsibility to ensure that we extract the material the world needs with the smallest possible impact, and that on the environment, sorry, impacts on the environment and the benefits of the community from our operations to outlast our operations. We acknowledge the impact of the Fondale Dam collapse had on the communities of Minister Rias and Espiritu Santo, and we will do what's necessary to, to remediate and compensate for, for those impacts, and we ensure that another tragedy does not occur. When we, when we talk about the Earth as a whole, we have to talk about climate change, though, and technology is another enabler to help us with climate change. We accept climate change is real and that human impact is clear. That is reality. And we accept our industry has contributed to that reality. But we also realise that developing nations need access to affordable, reliable energy. We need to make mining sustainable in the long term and that low emissions technology can provide sustainable energy and manage greenhouse gas emissions. Just as we strive to reduce our impact on the Earth's climate and be part of a long-term solution for the future of the planet, so too do we recognise our role in protecting one of our most precious resources, water. We've recently uh, released our inaugural and annual water report, which discloses our performance on water management across the various regions that we operate in line with the ICMM guidelines, which is the International Mi Council of Mining and Metals. The shared, the, the, the shared uh, nature of water uh, resources means we must think beyond the fence and work closely with communities, government and industry as a whole. BHP set itself some large targets to reduce withdrawal of water from, from our operations because communities and the environment need the fresh water. And once again, technology is one of the key enablers we're using to, to work through that in terms of how to apply technology in our operations to reduce the use of water in the operations for dust suppression, for how we operate, how we grind, how we extract in a, in a very efficient and effective way. Increased pressure on water resource means we, we must do more to responsibly meet water needs today and safeguard water supplies for future generations also. This is not only for our future, but it's also for the future of the local communities uh, and the environments which we operate beyond our operations life. Here in Brazil, our focus in relation to water has been to repair the Rio Dolce and the various tributaries that feed the Rio Dolce to ensure they're restored 
and they are a quality that they were before the Fondau dam break. Many of the, many of the programs of Renova Foundation relate to water quality. The, right, the river is vital to the communities that live along the banks and it's crucial uh, to us that the lives of those communities are restored. And when I became a miner, we did not have a focus on these impacts on global climate change, never heard of it. Water was available out of the tap, uh, you know, extraction out of rivers and creeks and, and, and so far. However, um, we didn't obviously comprehend the value and benefits of being truly inclusive um, and, and making sure we use the water properly. Look, I'm a mining engineer by training and I first stepped onto a mine about 28 years ago. And I know I look younger than that. But when I did, I saw very few females. In fact, the men were as tough as they come, and as you can imagine. Mining was remote and physical, characterised by inflexible shifts, bullying and practical jokes were everywhere, and if you couldn't make it, you left. Advanced technologies in those days were really a hydraulic drill rig compared to previous, which was a pneumatic drill rig. And while we spoke about safety and we aimed to return home every day to our loved ones, it really wasn't at the heart of what we did. Gradually, women entered the workforce into operations, but life was extremely tough for them. Few companies bothered making women's uh, uh, women's uh, coveralls, overalls, and accommodation in camps was very difficult. As more, cons as more consideration has been given to our female colleagues and the value they bring to the workforce, mining has actually improved. In 2016, uh, recognising that only a truly diverse workforce that can harness the real potential of a whole operation and taking as many people from the population as we could to better affect the communities that we operate also, BHP set a challenging aspirational goal to achieve gender balance by 2025. When we analysed all of the operations and offices, we discovered that our most diverse teams were the ones that performed the best. And what I often hear is, oh, but, but women can't do that job. Only men can do that job. Or that's not designed properly for people. But through the use of technology and the use of innovation, you redesign the work so you can actually create a workplace that allows for both men and women to do the task. It's interesting, the statistics that we reviewed show that the safety performance was better, uh, diverse, uh, an all-inclusive and diverse operation, people were more willing to speak up on safety and to follow work practices in a routine way without diversion. The maintenance performance was better because inclusive and diversive teams adhere more to planned work. These teams were more engaged also, and ultimately our most diverse teams were also our most productive teams. Different opinions and approaches actually contribute to a better decision-making process and outcomes. But once again, through the use of technology and the use of innovation and the use of uh, bringing outside industry into the mining sector, we believe that's actually moving in the right direction, but m a lot to be done still. It makes good business sense from all the things we've seen so far to bring diver diversity and inclusion into the workplace. Our target of 2025 having uh, gender balance is a real target, and we're putting technology across our company through standardisation of work, standardisation of equipment, taking manual tasks out of the operations where we can so it doesn't matter who is doing the job, the job can be done in a standard way, whether male or female. Um, also, I think the other key part, by recruiting more widely, we are accessing a broader pool of talent for a more skilled workforce. We recruit from non-traditional mining sectors, including nursing, teaching, where we have uh, proven, where we've actually uh, prop where we've actually brought individuals in to help prove problem solving and, and prove project management also. Secondly, the terms and conditions that are needed to attract this diverse workforce is different to the past. So once again, technology is enabling that. 
We are doing more, more to do with flexible working arrangements, people working from home using good IT systems, virtual meetings, virtual, uh, and being much more flexible in terms of how teams can actually think. Thirdly, we're finding diverse teams are less susceptible to groupthink, challenging, safe to speak up, bringing their ideas to the table, and also making much better decisions. But technology, once again, is an enabler for all of these things. Becoming more inclusive will help BHP and other companies grow and create more opportunities for all of our people. By ensuring our company is an active member of the communities in which we operate, we should also develop stronger relationships with them. We also accept that as, a broad, as part of a broader society, we have a responsibility to engage on global issues where we have deep te technical knowledge and where we believe to have perspectives that may be of interest. And through our prospects series on our BHP website, we contribute our views to a range of world big challenges, such as climate change, safety, gender balance, and also education, raising the standard of education in the countries that we operate. Once again, uh, through the use of technology, innovation, and focus on these broad issues, we believe we can actually help our future industry become stronger and better. So as you can see, there's a common thread across uh, where we are as a company, some of the work we're doing uh, around um, improving our remediation and, and community and also performance and safety operations through better diversity and inclusion. All of it has a thread towards technology. And as, as Francisco had mentioned, I was the global head of technology uh, several years ago and I learned a lot about what other companies, other industries are doing with regards to technology that we can learn from. Technology enables um, operations like Serahon to measure and adjust its rehabilitation program instantaneously to ensure it's restoring an original state. It doesn't have to rework it, do it twice, um, you know, come back and do it again later. It's using technology to do it as it progresses. Technology is helping Renova Foundation reach and register tens of thousands of people along the Rio Dolce River, or Rio Dolce. And technology gives Samarco a clear three-dimensional picture of the remaining dams in the Gemino complex to ensure they're safe at all times. And across our businesses, technology presents opportunities to redesign the way we work. We can continue to find new ways to control risks, which is very important for our business, streamline processes, which means you become more effective and more efficient, and increase the capability of your people by being able to make decisions quickly with the right information at the right time. It's interesting, uh, when I look outside our industries, and I spent time in, in uh, Silicon Valley, which a lot of my friends laugh when I say that, from a heavy industry. And what I learned was, as industries, we, we hide information, we try and do things ourselves as intercompanies. But when you go into the technology companies, the, the IBMs, the Apples, the SAPs, the Ewer Packards, and many others, they don't hide it. They actually share it to, to leverage off each other, to actually learn, gain, make step change, and leverage. And often I think that's something we as an industry, as an industry in terms of mining and metals, we actually need to do better and challenge ourselves to the paradigms that we know best. Because we know best, not we know best. We can reduce health and safety risks, such as, such as those associated with vehicles, vehicle to vehicle crashes. We can reduce exposure to dust and other substances. We can improve productivity and lower our operating costs and be sustainable to meet the future requirements of the markets. And we can continue to investigate technology solutions that can monitor and reduce potential environmental impacts by being well ahead of the game with understanding what the data is telling us and having information to make decisions sooner, quicker, and not regretfully later. We continue to look for new ways to re remove people from sources of danger through the application of technology. So we have many of our uh, trucking fleets going automated. We have uh, downhole, downhole technology looking at how to extract value to, to reduce blasting and, and manual handing and extra shovels and trucks. 
And we also have technology to make our workplace safer for a diverse workforce also. Te technology is making traditionally male roles accessible to a range of people with differing physical capabilities. And automation and robotics mean tasks that used to be done that were heavy and bulky, required lifting and required sort of injuries that came as a result and certain qualifications and skills. They can be done safely now by a range of people without those qualifications necessarily. It also means you can standardise your workplaces to be repetitive, consistent routine and take out the manual handling and, and allows the job to be done effective and more efficient. And believe it or not, from the experience I've had and my company's had, the workforce embraces it and wants it as well. Achieving gender balance is going to be an enormous challenge in the mining industry. For a company as old as BHP, we are changing 133 years of industry convention. And that's also for technology as well. Diversity is part of the challenge, but it's also inclusion that makes the difference, ensuring everyone in the workplace and workforce feels engaged. We believe we are, set up, we are setting up for the challenge of creating this balance, and we have seen progress, but we don't believe it's enough, and we need to keep finding ways to improve. And as I said, by, by doing, bringing forward innovation technology faster, in a more constructive way, we can actually do that. So I want my daughters and your daughters uh, to include mining as part of their options when they consider their futures and make it attractive for them. We must all embrace the opportunities that technology brings us to be more productive and safer and the benefits our people will get and also the host communities will get from us doing that better. But technology can be disruptive. It can change the markets for our products and the way we are and the way that we used to use them. And it can create new markets. And we need to be ready for those opportunities. It brings all of us as the world continues to move very, very fast. The future of mining is very different from the past. We are no longer finders, extractors and sellers. We are a diverse bunch of people who supply the materials the world needs to live and an active voice on the issues that matter in society. We need to be the people who are trusted by communities and advocate, sorry, and active stewards of the environment while enabling long-term sustainable prosperity through productivity and financial outcomes and success. Society needs safe, responsible, sustainable and actually transparent productive mining sector. One which embraces and leads advances of technology, but also values the strengths in human relationships, both in the workplace and in the communities. And we can be that for the mining sector. That is the future I see for us. And I would like to thank you all for, for actively listening um, to my, uh, my speech. And I must apologise, I do need to leave uh, at 6.30, so I might, won't be able to stay for all the Q&A, but if you do have questions and answers in that time, I look forward to hearing them. Thank you very much.